Sahana Bhavatu, Sahana Bhunaktu, Sahaviryankarawahe, Tejasvina Vadhitamastu, Ma Vidvishawahe. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Let us first readdress the context of the Bhagavad Gita. The text that we're studying. This is going to help us give us some relevance in this text in relation to our personal lives. So what the Gita states is what we all want, irrespective of creed, age, background, is fulfillment. However, because we can't hold on to this fulfillment, then we either want more of it, more, or we want something different, because something that's uh, novel. This is everyone's experience, without a question, at all times, all ages. Not fulfilled, I can't hold on to it, therefore, I want one more time, or I want something different. However, the Gita states also, no matter how much more and how different, none of it is going to be fulfilling, which is only going to cause the cycle to repeat. Okay, then one more time or more of it. The reason is because the fundamental question has not been answered. And this fundamental question is, who is the receiver? So whatever is being received, no matter how much more or different, then onto whom is it coming onto? As long as that person remains ignorant of his or her nature, then that cycle of more and different will continue. It can come in the form of more materialism, more success, more prosperity. Even in spirituality, uh, more teachings, more knowledge, more uh, you know, practices, more meditation, longer meditation, right? So this is common in every area that we see. So Arjuna addresses for this very reason, right from the start in the Gita, he poses two questions. He says, first of all, he wants to know how to solve what is facing him, that means situational, that means he do doesn't discard the world and says, I don't need the world, even though he wanted to go to Rishikesh, to the mountains, but this is a human being, you know, everyone wants to sort of have their moment of giving up. So this is normal. So if you wanted to solve his situational in relation to us, this could be our home, uh, those who are close to us or our families or something that is relevant to you. He also wanted to know the truth of everything. So this is where he went right. Our situation is we either want to know one or two. I either want to know how to solve situational conditions or I put all that aside, discard it, say there's no value in it. And then we just go and pursue the truth. And we say the truth is everything. Everything else is the world. And you know, we put, put it one in two categories. Both are incomplete. Why? Because both are obvious and reality is one. So where's the question of putting importance to one and avoiding the other? Therefore, an integrated person addresses what is confronting me right now. Equally so, they address what is the truth of everything? Where do I fit in this big universe? A person who only focuses on one is a non-integrated person. They haven't gotten the teaching yet. That means they're yet to understand that you cannot avoid both or you cannot just pursue one of them because without the other, it is simply incomplete. So the person is going to be wondering, yeah, but what about this? So when I say thought into, that means meditated upon, inquired into. This means you're engaging your thought into 
number one and number two, situational and the big picture. So this healthy, this thinking, we can call it healthy thinking. So what is healthy thinking? It means I'm addressing both. So this healthy thinking involves two aspects of the mind. The first one is, let's just put it this way. Some people try to be 100% rational. You know, they want like logic in everything. Uh, give me the numbers. It's going to make sense, you know, with my, uh, it's going to kind of vibe with my intellect here. If it doesn't, I'm not interested. Incomplete. Others only act out of emotion. This means if it feels good, I go for it. And then it's justified, of course, by the intellect as it feels right. Uh, and I always go for what I, what I, you know, feels right. And that's how I go through life. So that means the intellect starts justifying the emotions. Both are incomplete if they're only one, one or the other. Why? Because you've got two hemispheres, <laughs> the rational and you've got the more creative side, right? So where is this question of focusing on the left hemisphere, you know, the, the, the man who's always stuck in his head or it doesn't matter what gender it is, or the other side, it's always, uh, you know, kind of going with the emotions and not backing that up with, you know, with some uh, rationale. It's no question of that because you're giving a brain with two hemispheres. Therefore, both of them, at least as a human being, have to be used uh, for an integrated person. So this means, let's now convert this. What does this mean for lasting transformation? Because we all want lasting transformation. No one is interested in short-term transformation that evaporates the next day. For lasting transformation to take place in any subject matter whatsoever, whether it is Vedanta, whether it is something which have privately on the side, it doesn't matter. For lasting transformation to take place, you must incorporate these two aspects in your thinking. If you only use cognitive, for example, then the subject matter, for example, take physics, it won't make any difference in your life because you haven't tied it emotionally. You haven't made it relevant to you. In fact, physics is an amazingly you know, vast topic. By the virtue of learning physics, you should be able to see technically that everything's atoms after all, everything's particles. So you shouldn't be you know, so attracted to things anymore. It should be more objective. But why is that not the case, even though physics is a you know, major topic? Because in the class, they're not tying this to you, the person, but rather this information that's being learned is out there. And then you're standing here, the student going, wow, this is all amazing. The moment you add this emotional component, you tie it to your personal life. That's when it starts to make a personal transformation. So if you're ever asking, why am I not having any personal transformations or you're feeling like things are going slow? The reason is simple. Just ask, am I integrating both aspects of thinking? The cognitive, that is the prefrontal cortex of the brain and the emotional capacity. Is that within the context of my teaching? So the question is now, how do you make things emotional? How do you make things relevant? How do you make a, a dry topic like mathematics, for example? How do you bring it closer so it actually has a transformation day-to-day? Uh, -day? Give me some ideas. Let's open this conversation. Like uh, mathematics? Um, yeah. So you meant it's a real life or? Uh, I mean, any topic. Use it. Okay. Yeah, any topic. How do we make any topic kind of closer to you so it actually has this... Um, you want to express it every day instead of just intellectualizing it as knowledge. Using it, that's it. That is the only option. Uh, after okay. reading it, go just see if you can use it somehow. Like if you say mathematics, uh, like when you see a, a list of items, maybe you, you tend to add them to get final price uh, to, to get engaged <laughs> or something like that. Okay. Okay. So use it. Sure. Making it relevant to your daily life. Okay, so how do we make things relevant? What actually has to go on for things to become relevant to you? Something functional for you to function, to get um, positive results. Okay, yeah, okay, good. So you're looking at how is this um, providing, a, you know, causing an improvement in my, in my experience. 
and maybe you can even weigh the option. You can say, well, here's what it's doing and here's how it's making me I'm more confident in myself. Okay, what else? With uh, mathematics and physics, I, I think they reflect an underlying structure of the way the universe is created and that gives me a sense of wonder. It creates a sense of wonder? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so I guess wonder is an internal process because not everyone finds it wondrous. <laughs> Why I find it wondrous is the complexity and the harmony and the symmetry is beyond what could be created by a human mind. Mm -hmm. So I see it as a proof of the existence of God. Okay. I see the mind of God reflected in those worlds. Okay. Okay. So you're connecting uh, something much, something seemingly unrelated to the subject matter. Okay. So that's another way to make things relevant. So in other words, what I got from that is connect something that is meaningful to you to something that you don't have much reference point to. It's, it's just like a neutral ground. Therefore, we bring something that's meaningful and we try to connect it together. It's even more than that. I see it as a, as a proof because I don't think the human mind is capable of, of creating all that. So it's evidence of a, an intelligence beyond human intelligence i.e. a creator, an intelligent creator, yeah. Okay, good, good. Someone else wanted to say something? Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, I see it as how does it add value to my goal and my uh, mission as to where I'm heading, and if it adds value to my journey, I would be more interested to learn about it. Okay, excellent, yep. So uh, mention your values and make sure those values are... Uh, personally relatable you relate to those values okay uh, i would try to see when i learn something how this can benefit society or people in general andre i think it's like a book like not all of us are going to choose the same book to read it's what we are looking for in that book and something that captures our our eyes and our mind and yeah. then we start reading it and and if it's interesting we continue to read it because we want to know what the outcome is at the end Okay. Good. Yeah, you know, this is uh, similar to language learning. You know, if you're learning a new language and you're just learning it for the sake of learning the language, then it's not going to stick a long time. It was going to be forgotten or it, it, life is just sort of going to just overshadow your learning ability. So this means if you're learning a language, you need to first know what is this, like, where is this going to be used in the first place? Right, so you need you need to be it's need to be relevant to your life right now, and you need to discover its relevance to you now. You need to see okay, what, where exactly is this uh, helping me to be to expand as a human being in my life, and then you assess that. So it takes some time to look at those those um, those benefits. Okay, anything else? Okay, if, if, for, if some people do it just for the pure joy of it. For example, people who do abstract mathematics. Uh, yeah. There are so many mathematical concepts which, uh, which were invented around 1,000 years, 500 years ago. Till now, there is no application for that. But people still learn it still so that it gives that pure enjoyment of learning something, knowing something. Yeah, excellent. Thing, yeah. yeah, excellent. So there's no particular reason. Uh, it's just the, the, the joy of knowledge. Okay, Robert's laughing. I think he uh, has the joy of knowledge there. <laughs> okay, so this thinking that we're speaking of, which is both intellect and emotions, 50-50 ratio balanced, it can go in two directions. The first one is introverted. Now, there is an productive introverted thinking, there's unproductive introverted thinking. Unproductive is whereby the person introverts, that means they make the thoughts about themselves. So introverted means the thinker is put in the spotlight. The very thinker starts to think about their own thought processes. Now, the unproductive way is to say things like, oh, I feel so sorry for myself. You know, I'm not good enough. Um, you know, why do I always fail? It's kind of this negative talk. It's unproductive because end of the the end of this conversation, this narrative, you haven't grown. You only, you know, kind of suppressed yourself even more from moving forward. That's why we call it unproductive. The other one is productive. For example, all 700 verses in the Gita, Arjuna hasn't asked a single question 
for example, like why did Duryodhana do that? Not in what, all 700 verses, not one question was about another person. What was every question that Arjuna asked, what was it about? It said, why do I feel like this? How can I change my perception about this to be more empowered? That is a quality of an excellent student. Whereas most, where do most of our questions go? <laughs> why did he do that? You know, what's wrong with him? How could he? How could she? And all of his questions, hey, Lord, help me understand my own mind. Why does my mind think like this about that? That's called an excellent student. This is called introverted thinking. The second is extroverted thinking. This is whereby the thinking is mostly about something that is external to this thinker over there. So this is where the thinker remains safe because they're in a safe place and they're evaluating, they're auditing something out there. This is much easier than introvert. The introverted requires you, the thinker, to attack him or herself, her own thoughts. Whereas extroverted, I'm safe. I'm just going to ask questions about them. Now, extroverted has proper and improper way. The improper way is to think about others, about that over there. And pretend like you're good, like, you know, I care. I'm thinking about you, um, I'm caring about you. This is called putting on a facade, putting on a, um, um, an agenda to save face. In other words, I want to appear a certain person as if I'm trying to save the world. So then I start to think about over that. And then they ask me, well, why, why are you thinking this? Well, because, you know, let's discuss the, 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 the larger problems. So this is whereby the person has external composure and yet internally disbalanced. And how does this internal disbalance get, this, get uh, coped with? By putting the spotlight on others. That means others have a problem and I need to save them. This is the improper extroverted method. It only reinforces one's individuality and one's likes and dislikes. Because in order to, for a person to say something, you always say something that reflects what you like or what you don't like. Therefore, it pollutes the mind even more. It creates an even a louder narrative. The proper way is to say, what consequences will this have on others? What consequences will his or her actions have on others? This means you're now incorporating compassion. You're starting to think. You're not judging them. You're just saying, okay, so if this is going to have a unpleasant consequences, then if I can do something, I gladly will. If not, then may they have lucidity in their life. Now, in reference to growth, how do we apply this thinking that we're just talking about, which involves intellect and emotion? This thinking is outlined in chapter 12 using five different sadhanas. In other words, what is chapter 12 title? Bhakti Yoga. But the other title for it, which we can re rename is How to Think Properly. So what is chapter 11 title? If you remember, Vishwarupa Ish Ishwara Yoga. And I renamed it to Having an Extraordinary Attitude in an Ordinary World. Dot, dot, dot. Chapter 12, by learning how to think properly. Dot, dot, dot. Chapter 13, through the means of 20 universal values to cultivate for life in chapter 13. So chapter 12 is nothing but how to refine your thinking higher and higher so that it can incorporate the larger vision. And in verse 3 to 5, Krishna starts with the highest method of thinking, which is called Nirguna Bhakti, Jnana Yoga. So what is Nirguna Bhakti? It is whereby the meditation upon oneself as the truth of everything. That's what the meditation is about. What is the meditation on? Upon oneself as the very truth of everything. While at the same time, you're not negating relativity. You're not negating the body, 
the thoughts, the mind, other people, experiences, nothing. Suppose that a pot acknowledges its relative form, which is called pot, because it serves a function. It can put some water there, it can put a candle in here. So it definitely has a function in this world and people need a pot. They need it to light a home, to have a fire. So the pot doesn't say, well, I'm useless because it, ha it does have a relative function in this world, but it always knows that the very truth of it is the clay. So this means it acknowledges its relative form, it honors its relative form, while at the same time, it always keeps in mind that the truth of me, the truth of my form is the very clay. So therefore in Nirguna Bhakti, that is Jnana Yoga, when this pot meditates, it's not turning the clay into another object within the pot's mind, but rather understands in the presence of this clay, inquiry happens. In the presence of this clay, I am. In other words, the pot doesn't turn the very clay as another object and starts to meditate, oh, okay, I'm the clay because the very thinker is already the clay. The very inquirer is already the clay. Therefore, this is what we mean when we say you cannot objectify consciousness because you already are consciousness. The pot cannot objectify this clay because whatever attempt it does to do so, it is only because it is already the clay. Without this clay, can the pot exist? No. Therefore, for the very existence of the pot implies I must thus be the clay because there is only clay. Okay, now in respect to jnana yoga, which we're going to do in verse five, this meditation that this pot performs is called or is done in three stages, shravanam, mananam, and nidityasanam. And what's the result of these three stages? It is a certain freedom that is expressed as a general contentment in relation to everything. So we're not going to, you know, put these fancy names on what moksha is, just a general contentment of what is. For example, suppose you have a diver who is a professional and what does a professional diver have? Obviously knowledge how to dive. So this means the diver has a certain level of confidence jumping into the water. Yes. Okay. Now suppose the diver is on a sinking boat. Now the diver surely will be concerned. It's not like the diver is going to say, oh, I'm free. I'm so, I'm so uh, invincible. No, the diver is going to have concerns for jumping to the water, but, the, but through that concern, there will be a level of confidence. Why? Because the diver has a knowledge about what I'm jumping into. Whereas a beginner who also is going to jump from a sinking boat, will also have concerns, definitely. And those very concerns are enough to drown the beginner. Why? Because the beginner is lacking knowledge and this lack of knowledge causes the beginner to ingest unnecessary amount of water and drown himself in the ocean of experience called samsara. So therefore, two people are jumping over. One of them has knowledge. One of them does not have knowledge. They're both in the ocean. It's not like they're both, you know, it's not like the one who has knowledge is like, oh, it's just, why, are you, why are you nervous? No, they're both nervous. They're both human beings because it's still a body, they're still a human being. But the one of them in and through their nervousness still has a level of contentment, level of confidence swimming in this ocean. So this is where jnana yoga comes. This is what I mean by a certain level of confidence or contentment in and through the life challenges. So that's the summary from last week. Now let's move on to verse five. Kleshodhi kataraste sham avyakta sakta chetasam avyakta higatir duhkam de havadhirava pyate. Greater is the affliction for those whose minds are committed to what cannot be objectified for an end which cannot be objectified is reached with difficulty by those who are, are identified with the body. Now skip down uh, yeah. and read third last paragraph, even though there are great. Even though there are great difficulties for the karma yogi who is, but 
Matkarmat, um, who's totally committed to Bhagwan, the difficulties of those committed to the pursuit of Aksara Brahma are even greater. Klesha Adi Kartaha. Here Bhagwan uses the comparative uh, affix Tara. Identification with the body is an obstacle for Nirguna Brahma Dhyana. The affliction is even greater because they have identification with the body. Deha Abhimana. It means their Atma Anatma Viveka is not complete. Sannyasis cannot be contemplative if they lack Viveka. Without it, their pursuit will be improper because of confusion about what they are doing. Devaha means the one who has a body. Everybody has a body. So what it means here is those who have identification with the body. For them, meditation upon Aksara Brahma is almost impossible. Meditation here means contemplation preceded by Shravana and Manana. All these become very difficult. Why is there more difficulty? Because the sannyasi is trying to give up his identification with the body. What could be more difficult? Okay, that's enough. Thank you. So here, Krishna is pointing out that both paths pose challenges to the bhakta. Number two paths, Nirguna Bhakti and Saguna Bhakti. So let's just take Saguna Bhakti. Where is the challenges in Saguna Bhakti? If you remember, Saguna means Karma Yoga level one, level two, Upasana Yoga level one, level two. Let's take Karma Yoga level two. To practice Karma Yoga has certain demands upon the one who's practicing it. And what are these demands? First of all, you need to be conscious of every action deliberate and conscious in and through all of your actions, conscious about what comes out from the mouth, conscious about, you, you know, uh, how to respond, when to respond. So this deliberate thinking in Karma Yoga requires you to be fully responsible and accountable for all of your actions. This means not a single action should go, oh, and it just happened because I, it was beyond me. No, you take accountability. It came from me. I could have done better, but nevertheless, it just, it still did come for me. So this means the person takes responsibility. So right there, some of us aren't able to do that fully. You know, we sort of like, because it's easier, like an extroverted thinking type, easier to put thoughts out there. So in that same way, we don't want to put full accountability, own up that every, our life is entirely a result of our own action. The other requirement for Karma Yoga is... It requires you to put universal ethics, dharma, above your own likes and dislikes. I don't like him or her, so I'm just going to like, you know, say something. But what does it mean to say, instead of that, I'm going to conform to dharma? It means this is a living human being. He or she may be mis misperceived. They may be not clear. But it doesn't mean they're an evil person. It just, I mean, it just means they're going through a hard time. Something may have happened. And for this reason, I'm going to offer some, some comfort. So this means you're taking your time to think you're, t you're dealing with another human being and not just someone to quickly write a comment and then send and then off to the next thing. So in other words, karma yoga requires to be deliberate. How? By ex conforming to dharma. It also means that a person, by conforming to dharma, loses some of their freedom of experience or freedom of expression because what is expression doing what i enjoy and not doing what i don't enjoy in other words doing what i like and what i don't like and this expression now becomes deliberate in the name of dharma and not many are willing to do this because our whole life we've been trained hey no one's watching i can do whatever i want the irony is yes you can do whatever you want but every time a person does that at the expense of violating dharma, it causes another impurity in the mind, more noise that the person then later has to deal with in a form of uh, the mind just doesn't shut off. So in a sense, you cannot do whatever you want because dharma is always in operation. And the karma yogi thus acknowledges this and doesn't just do whatever they want. They say, is this for the highest and greatest good? Is this hurting? Is this unfair? If it is, then no, I'm not going to do that. So this means karma yoga level two, it does require to sacrifice some entitlements that you think you have 
in order to abide to this universal order called Dharma. Why? Because you know that everything provides punya and papa, every act. So this is the challenge with karma yoga. Now, what about upasana yoga? Let's look at level one. Remember, upasana yoga level one is uh, those various yoga practices like ashtanga yoga. The challenge with level one is you need to keep focus of the mind for an extended amount of time on a particular object. Is that easy? Focusing on one thing for an extended amount of time? No, not at all. Because the mind, just the nature of the mind is fluid. You can be meditating for 30 minutes. One dog bark is enough to send you out of that 30 minute meditation. That is just the nature of the mind. Not easy at all. That's the challenge with level one. Level two, the meditator who is doing so upon Vishwarupa Ishwara may eventually feel like, yeah, I'm missing out because there's so many things that I don't know about. So even if I think about Ishwara, what about all of those realities that I'm yet to know about? So the person may have a sense of I'm missing out Therefore, I want something else that, you know, kind of gives me that fulfillment where I'm not missing out. So all of the levels provide challenges. The entire Saguna uh, practice, whereby what are you doing? You're turning something, an object, into an object of meditation. So it's not that hard because you're still objectifying something in your mind. Now, if Saguna is hard, then what to say of nirguna bhakti, whereby there's nothing to hold on to. It's formless consciousness. At least with saguna bhakti, I can take an idol that represents divinity, put it in my mind and focus on it. At least I'm having some tangible results. But nirguna bhakti, all of that goes. Nothing to grasp onto. Because we said you cannot objectify consciousness. So what does then Krishna say? He says, kleshaha, in other words, nirguna bhakti, that is jnana yoga, is most difficult to reach, most difficult, owning to the firm attachment to your physical body. When we say physical body, we're talking about specifically sukshma sharira and stula sharira. That means the subtle body and the physical body, the mind of cognition and emotions and the physical body. Now, what are some reasons that we are so attached to this physical body? Well, the obvious one is we've been attached since the beginning is beginning. This is just one more life of attachment. That's why you're born. But let's provide some more tangible reasons that we can work with. The first reason for being attached to this physical body even if the person says, no, I'm not, it is likely they're still attached. Is there's an inherent obsession with sustaining your survival, comforts, and security. This is just inbuilt. So this is the first obstacle you have to deal with. Everyone wants to survive. Everyone wants to feel healthy, feel good, feel light. Everyone does. And this is also due to past habits because we're all grown up by, by the mere fact of, oh, okay, here's how to, here's a chair, a soft uh, cushion, a you know, nice soft bed. And then you associate all of this to me. Okay, so I want comfort. But this I is linked to the body. Therefore, the whole life ends up being into comfort building or increasing the comfort. In other words, you're not so privileged to be grown up in a family where everything was offered in a, on a silver platter because these families sometimes, not always, are actually even more of an obstacle <laughs> in a sense that everything was provided to you, all the comforts were there, and I just trained the mind even deeper that yes, the body is important. So you can look at it from two ways. Yes, in one hand, the family that is stable can be a means for peace learning, but it doesn't always mean that. It can also go the other way. It can mean a, a state of, well, you know, I'm entitled and I can do whatever I want. In other words, I, the body, can do whatever it wants. Thus, it associates even more attachment. 
Furthermore, this attachment to the body is reinforced through your relationships. Because to relate to another person, does it not mean you have to be an independent person to express your personality when you're relating with another? Yeah. So the more relations that I have, the more I have to reinforce my individuality as a body. Because every transaction that happens in a relationship happens how? Through the physical body. Okay, so now what's the consequence of this? Habit to objectify everything. Well, the consequence is the person is trained to grossify, to turn everything into an object. Me, object over there, another body, another object, food, experience, comfort. So the entire life becomes about objectification. Now, suppose you tell someone like this, hey, this nirguna bhakti, this final reality, is something that you cannot objectify. And yet the whole life went into turning things into an object, relating with object, either through the five senses or thinking, lying on the bed, wondering where is he, where is she? Oh, you know, I love, I wanna feel more love. All of these experiences in the mind, objectifying. And now Nirguna says, you are not objectifiable because consciousness, as we said last week, is abhyakta, imperceptible. Achintayam cannot be conceived. Anirdesham cannot be described in words. And yet our whole life goes into perceiving things, thinking about things, and describing things through words. So what does this mean? It means the only way such a person is going to relate to this attributeless reality is how? by turning it into another object of knowledge in the brain. The pot is going to turn the clay into another object of knowledge inside its little head. Uh, I saw the other day, by the way, there's an article. It went like this. Harvard scientists. So immediately go, wow, you know, credibility, Harvard scientists. Okay, good so far. Harvard scientists think they've pinpointed the physical source of consciousness. There's a headline. So what are we saying? Even in science, this error gets made. Consciousness gets objectified in the scientist's mind. So the only way to know this reality is through the Shastra. That's, why the, that's the sole purpose of the Shastra, to know the final reality, which simply cannot be known any other way, even through science observations. Now let's ask, why specifically can a bhakta not objectify formless consciousness or not relate to formless consciousness? Because consciousness is the subject, right? I mean, that's the standard, yeah? Okay, super. Because this very reality is myself. In other words, you cannot accomplish your existence. You cannot accomplish what is already accomplished. And yet our whole life, what do we do? When I have to accomplish something, I need to do something. I need to perform some steps. The pot needs to you know, move its hand, you know, move its uh, eyes, move its ears, listen to things, see things, move, you know, go to th somewhere. And yet when it comes to formless reality, all of that fails. Why? Because the person who's doing all of that is already the truth, is already accomplished. And yet our whole life, what do we do? When I want to accomplish, I need to move from here to here to here to here, etc. So what does this mean in relation to the person? Because I am, everything gets objectified. Because Tang is, every taste gets tasted. So now how is the Tang going to know itself? Because it cannot know itself directly because it doesn't have any taste of its own. It's attributeless. How is the tongue going to know itself? Only in reference to other tastes. Because there is taste implies there must be a tongue. I can only know myself as Brahman how? In reference to ongoing tastes in life. When is life not going on? Life is just one big taste in different fashions. That's why we said consciousness cannot be known directly, 
but it still can be known indirectly through what's called pramana, means of knowledge. And one of those means of knowledge, those methods is use the tongue. Because taste is, there is tongue. Because experience is, there is I am. And that I am is the very consciousness. Because what is consciousness? That which illumines experience. What is tongue? That which illumines tastes. Okay, so now what is the solution to reduce this strong attachment to the body? Because we said that the body is one of the primary reasons that this reality cannot be fully comprehended. At least it is hard. One of the ways that the uh, Gita says is, whenever you think of your body, remind yourself it belongs to Ishwara. It's not mine. It's not your property. So it's actually childish if you think about it, to be obsessed over property that you don't own. You're given this body, the bones. We don't even know how many bones in our own body, and we call it our body. I mean, technically what is yours, you should know everything about it, and yet we don't. So through this, we relinquish our ownership to the Lord. And this reduces this need to individuate myself. Okay. Now, the second reason, the original question was, what are some of the reasons that there's a strong attachment to the body? Is the bhakta lacks necessary qualifications. And the two primary ones are dispassion and discernment. Dispassion means that you see, in order to be dispassionate about something, about toys, you have to have knowledge what a toy is for. So without knowledge, there's no dispassion. And viveka means you're discerning the nature of that object. That means the object is fleeting, for example. It passes, it changes in quantity and quality. Therefore, to hold onto it and to make a huge deal out of it is actually energy wasting. It doesn't, uh, it's not productive because it's not going to last forever. So these are some of the examples how Viveka and Vairagyam, dispassion, are applied. Of course, dispassion means, uh, we're talking, there's two kinds of dispassion. There's a dispassion whereby you're cold, there's a person is not interested, and there's the other dispassion whereby they address the environment, and yet they know where do I stand in relation to the environment. If I can help, I will do something. If not, if I have no place in this position, in this environment, then you simply don't get involved. Okay, and the third reason is, even if you understand the Shastric teachings, and you understand it really well, what happens still? The old patterns of thinking still overshadow that knowledge. For example, suppose that you learn in order to communicate to a human being, you need to give, be patient and you need to give them some time to explain themselves, right? You know that logically, you would read that because you know, it's a human being, so I need to show some empathy and some patience. And yet we still find ourselves impatient and dismissing them and then we catch ourselves and then we say, it just came out. I couldn't help it, it just came out in a conversation. Let's open a question. How do you deal when something just comes out and you know it is not in line with Dharma? It is not, um, it, it doesn't uh, reflect the good opinion of yourself and yet it just comes out and you realize that. How do you handle this? Apologize. Okay, apologize, good step. <laughs> Simple. What else can we do? Um, maybe something after, do we reflect on it? What do we do? Try to find the root cause why I said it in the first place. Yeah, tra uh, trace the root cause, good. Okay, so one of the reasons why we would trace the root cause is because if we don't, it's going to probably come again in the future. So this means, yes, step one, apologize. Step two, trace the root cause. Take some time to think about what has happened. Okay, what else can we do when it just comes out? Try to, if you've done something that's um, harmful or hurtful, Try to do the opposite to balance what you've just done. So, oh, okay. probably fine. Okay, excellent. Uh, so, Robert is talking about something Sanskrit called Pratipaksha Bhavana. And this is an extremely powerful tool whereby 
you apply the opposite to something that was done inappropriate. Or if you think something inappropriate about something, then you create an equally opposing thought that is reflective of something that represents uh, their div divine nature. So if I say, for example, if, I look, if a pot looks at another pot and goes, um, you know, I, I just, I have a problem with that pot. Then the spot is gonna say, well, what exactly about that other pot is making me think like this? Yeah. This pot, this other pot, you know, the spot says, this other pot could also have qualities that are, uh, that I could learn from. I just don't see them right now because they're, we're not in an appropriate position. But if I knew this other pot, I would definitely learn some, see some positive qualities. So this is a tool that I would like to talk about in chapter 13. It's one of the values of Dharma. So let's do a quick summary. Why are both difficult? Saguna dhyanam, saguna bhakti, is difficult because it requires unshakable faith. Right? It requires persistence, deliberation. And nirguna dhyanam, that is jnana yoga, requires strong viveka and strong detachment vairagyam. So this should be comfort number one. What's comfort number one? We should now know if the path is hard, if you think this is hard, that's good news because it's supposed to be hard. If someone says that this is supposed to be easy, if you look into, that, into this person a little bit, you get to know them closer, they will probably say, no, it is not easy. So remember that thinking, extroverted, I show an external facade. I show an external projection. Everything's okay, but internally, my thoughts are different. So this means there's an incongruence. So if the person is really congruent with themselves, then whatever they feel, that's exactly what they're going to say. In that same way, a true bhakta who's congruent is going to say, hey, this is not easy because the path is lonely, right? It's much easier to um, apply the path of uh, enjoyment. Ashreya means I do what I know needs to be done. I do what's hard and necessary. And the path of prayaha, this is in Upanishads, is what, is what is easy and yet unnecessary and brings instant gratification. That's very easy, isn't it? So the person is constantly having to make sacrifices to do what is right and yet what is hard, but what is necessary. If jnana yoga is hard, then what is the solution? Well, the wrong answer to this question would be, and this is a common answer, by the way, is to say, try different paths to liberation. It's okay, just drop jnana yoga. You don't need it yet. Um, in fact, you don't need it at all. Just go into other things like karma yoga, raja yoga, kundalini yoga. Um, you know, have a guru put his or her uh, hand on your head and transfer shaktipat liberation. Um, go and, you know, go and, uh, go and be in the presence of someone that is liberated. It's okay. There's many, many paths to this, uh, uh, to this, uh, to this uh, moksha. Okay, we will break this down, the statement. What is the correct answer to this question? If jnana yoga is difficult, then what is the solution? The correct answer is the Vedas with lucidity states that jnana yoga alone leads the aspirant to the final goal, moksha. They're very clear about this. That means nothing else in existence can do the job except jnana yoga. Now, obviously, you're going to say, you know, you need to demonstrate this. You need to prove this. How is this so? Because there are many paths, no doubt. But what is the logic for making this statement? So the logic is, first, we need to understand what does Advaita Vedanta state? Right from the beginning, it states, there is only one reality, and I am already that right now but think i am not because of the superimposition of my body mind attributes over atma over my true identity which is consciousness remember atma means consciousness brahman means consciousness atma means consciousness from the standpoint of the jiva the person brahman means same consciousness from the standpoint of the total it just means consciousness and this is what we call what i just explained ignorance of my true nature when i superimpose the body mind attributes over atma and then talk about myself as if i am the body mind now the question is what is the only principle that opposes 
ignorance because I said this is called ignorance of my true nature. So now what opposes ignorance? Knowledge. In other words, it has to be the knowledge which specifically removes the ignorance pertaining to that topic. If you want to learn how to be a chef, then you don't go to a class on programming and learn programming. You're going to learn how to be, you're going to read books pertaining to chef because you want to remove cooking ignorance. Therefore, I get cooking knowledge. I want to remove Spanish ignorance. Therefore, I go specifically to a Spanish class. I want to remove ignorance pertaining to the self. Therefore, I specifically learn self-knowledge, which is called otherwise jnana yoga, only found within the Shastra. Now, Adi Shankara in his um, Atma Bodha has a wonderful metaphor, and you probably heard it before. He says, imagine there is a dark room and there's many objects in the room. Now, obviously to transact with those objects, you need the light, right? Otherwise, no conversations can take place. In fact, the only way that a conversation the only thing that makes a conversation possible is by the fact that the objects in the room are illumined. So obviously you want to now bring light into this room. And so then you set up a 10 day Vipassana retreat in the, in the room in order to light up the room. It doesn't work. You chant uh, Vishnu, uh, Sahasranama, you know, 1000 names of the Lord to light up the room. It doesn't work. You do 18 yoga, 18 Hatha yoga sequence. It doesn't work. Some Tai Chi Chuan, 24 young style. It doesn't work. You go and uh, you know, uh, chant and do your, your, your japa. It doesn't work. You try so many things in one lifetime. It doesn't work. What is the only thing that's going to light up that room? Yeah. Turn on the light. In other words, no practice in the universe has any power except one alone. And that is to bring actual light in the room. In that same way, self, which is called atma, which means consciousness, the knowledge of that self alone can liberate the individual. Nothing else can work. Because why? I don't know who I am. The only way to know something is by gaining knowledge so that I may know who I am. And as I said, this knowledge specifically must be related to I am. And this knowledge erases the notions which deny me the knowledge of myself. Therefore, I must gain that knowledge to remove that ignorance. Well, suppose you say, uh, I'm going to do some pranayama. Okay, fine. But what does pranayama direct? Where is it directed to? Right, the prana of your body. In other words, it affects the pranayama, pranamaya kosha. It specifically is intended for that. Yes, it does also influence the mind because they're connected. But it doesn't touch what? It doesn't touch the person who, onto whom the pranayama is done. It doesn't touch the person who needs to exist in the first place for the pranayama to happen. Therefore, no matter how much pranayama you do, you're still not going to touch the subject as Pavan said. So this is the first reason why, the first logical reason why self-knowledge alone can remove the beginningless problem, thus to liberate the person. There's a second reason though, and this one's more down to earth, and yet it is as equally convincing. Where is the Bhagavad Gita happening? On the Kurukshetra. Between whom? The student and Krishna, the Lord himself. Now, what does Arjuna say, and where does he say that? He says it in the most urgent place, in the most loudest place, in the most place where you, you, you need urgency. And what does Arjuna say? Help me, give me that knowledge, give me the solution to liberation. And what does Krishna, the Lord, the all-knowing Lord of the universe, what does he say? Okay, here is the chapters of the Bhagavad Gita. Do you think why doesn't Krishna, the all-knowing Lord, why doesn't he provide him a shortcut? Because the last thing you need on the battlefield is a discourse. You don't have time to listen to a discourse. You just give me some shortcut. Put your hand on my head, liberate me. Do something, give me a sequence, some yoga sequence to liberate me. 
None of that happens. What does the, the all-knowing Lord himself do? Okay, you want liberation? I'm going to give you self-knowledge, which is exactly what we're learning here, in the most inappropriate place where the least thing that you want is to be given a discourse. So think about it this way. If the Lord himself, who lacks no knowledge, the all-knowing, cannot think of a better way to liberate than to give self-knowledge, then what to say of those who claim they can give you liberation through techniques, through some special methods, through some special breathing. And we're talking the all-knowing God. You want liberation? I will give you liberation in the most inconvenient place that is the battlefield. So these two reasons show us that self-knowledge alone is the method for liberation. It is the highest rung of the ladder. Now, suppose that a person affirms and they say, okay, I understood you know, that was convincing enough that jnana yoga alone is the highest rung of the ladder. However, I still don't relate to it. I don't get along with jnana yoga. There's a distance between us. I don't quite relate to it. Very common. Some of the complaints for jnana yoga that will reveal this distance or not being related, uh, or not aiming to get along with it is, the first one is, this sounds too intellectual. Heard this before many times. This is too cere cerebral, you know, too much in the head. You're thinking too much. Just lighten up, man. You know, why does it have to be so hard? I'm a simple man. I'm a simple woman. I don't need all of this thinking and, you know, a uh, going inside and an hair splitting details. I don't need any of that. I've heard this before. That's another justification not to listen to or get involved in yana yoga. The scriptures are outdated. Who needs that? Give me something simple, a technique, a method that's going to do the job. These are all statements coming from a mind that is still not relating to the highest rung of the ladder. So what does all of this mean? It needs to come down one letter down. Therefore, the next verse, we will speak about how to obtain the qualifications for jnana yoga so that it may become easy. So we will talk about upasana yoga level two, we're going down, which is between verse six to eight. Yoga. Just a question. Mm -hmm. yeah, it is a question. I mean, if, if um, jnana yoga is, is the way uh, to liberation, mm -hmm. does it also mean understanding the knowledge or is also understanding and practicing and living the knowledge? Yeah, okay, sure. Okay, sure. So it is uh, all of it because it, it does involve three stages. And the first stage, of course, is listening and thinking about what you're listening and you're tying that to your personal experience. That means you're seeing how what I'm hearing is true. So this is a common thing with the Upanishads is that you, the listener is not supposed to doubt the Upanishads. They're supposed to say, how can I match my thinking to what the Upanishads are saying? So this is what happens in the first stage. I listen. In the second stage, uh, there is a involvement of your mind. That means you're using your viveka, the sermon, to, to kind of remove those last doubts that are still um, lurking, you know, throughout different situations. And you can't quite see um, how is now Vedanta applicable to modern life or where does it have its practicality? All of these things you need to resolve through as you engage or transact with the, with the environment. And then the Tyasanam just means that even after I've you know, done all of these, uh, these stages, which is a lot of work, then you still find yourself you know, generally wanting to be a better person, improving, self-improvement. And this is for the sake of just Antah Karana Shuti, you purifying that mind. So yes, it is an active process from the beginning all the way to the end. The end means specifically to the last breath. Because think about it this way, who wants to stop improving? No one. It's your nature to want to be better. Right, that's why we say it to the last breath. I got a question as well, Andre. Yes. Um, so what Gita is saying is we need this knowledge for liberation. Mm -hmm. I can read the Gita, and but if I don't understand it, then I'm still not, not having the knowledge, is it? I'm not getting the knowledge. Yeah. I have uh, to 
put it into my life and understand it and accept it yeah. and use it for my benefit. Indeed, yeah. yeah. Otherwise, it's just a lot of words on a piece of paper. Yeah, and you know, it is using that actually shows you how well you've really understood it because anything that you've understood very well, it's going to become part of your personality, your thinking, and your emotional um, guidance system. So this means if a person is just reading and, you know, every day is about, let me just read one more verse. And yet the moment you finish reading, you close that book and you go back to your old life. It means that the knowledge is not properly taking place. So this means if a person finds themselves doing that, they just, it's better to stop and get a proper teaching methodology that's going to delve into every verse and, and help you tie it in with your life. That's going to be a lot more beneficial than reading the Gita over and over and over again. Sometimes I get it, and sometimes, I, sometimes it's gone. So. Yeah, you know, this, uh, this switch that goes on and off <laughs> is absolutely normal because, you know, you're carrying a lot of impressions. We all do carry impressions that are thinking in the old methods. And these old methods are still going to overshadow. They're still strong at the beginning, and they're going to turn off the lights. And then, you know, you feel maybe in the morning more sattvic, more kind of like alive. And it's like, ah, oh, okay, everything's fine. I'm understanding it. And then, you know, comes the kind of a drowsy part of the day. You just want to sleep. And then it just kind of switches off again. So this is going to happen at the start, no doubt. Um, however, the goal is because, see, we're talking about a reality that you are always. So it's not a matter of going on and off. It's just a matter of a by being that and knowing I am that. Uh, however, to start, sure, on and off is uh, going to be your companion. So this means it's an indicator. There's more work to do. Okay, so again, on and off means more work to do, more inquiry, more nidityasana, more maranam. For example, you can ask, why do I get it? And why do I have levels of clarity? See, one who's clear, it means they're clear 24-7. There's no moment when they're not clear. It just means in and through everything, whether you're tired, whether you're energized, it makes no difference whatsoever because there is an understanding. And understanding means full. So it's not a matter of changing or 99%. It's full. Once it's full, it's full. In and through everything. Yetu sarvani karmane maye sanyasya matparaha Ananye naiva yogena mandhyayanta upasate tesha mahamsa mudharta mrityu samsara sagarat bhavami nachirat partha maya veshita chetasam Those who worship me, keeping me as the ultimate end, giving up all actions unto me, meditating upon me, with a commitment in which there is indeed no other. For them whose minds are absorbed in me, Patha, Arjuna, before long I become the liberator from the ocean of samsara that is fraught with death. Continue. It says, Lord is everything for them. Just a little bit down. Lord is everything for them. The ultimate goal, like the master is, for the servant. By fulfilling the Lord's mandates, they express their commitment to him, okay. uh, confining all karmas to me. Okay. Karma, they meditate upon me. Okay, that's enough. Uh, and I want someone else now to read so we all get a chance. Um, page 157, how do we dedicate our actions to Bhagavan? Um, how do we dedicate our action to Bhagavan? As we saw before, it is acting in accordance with dharma and adharma, right and wrong, not in accordance with raga and dvesa, likes and dislikes. I, as human beings, we are endowed with the faculty of choice. We can choose to act or not to act in keeping with the commonly accepted norms. Those norms are not created by, by a human being. They're part of the creation. Therefore, conforming to them is seeing oneself as not separate from Ishvara. 
dharma, like other natural laws, is not a visible mandate from Ishvara. For example, we do not see the law of gravitation, only its manifestation in a falling object. Similarly, we do not see dharma, but it is manifest in our natural urges like not wanting to be hurt. From that, we understand that non-injury is dharma. This is why it is said that conscience is God. Conscience is nothing but dharma and adharma manifest as our own common sense appreciation of right and wrong. Conformity to that as Ishvara is worship. This has to be said because we also have likes and dislikes that need not conform to a sense of dharma. When they are made subordinate to dharma and adharma, we become karma yogis. Okay, enough. Thank you. Uh, someone else, page 158. They meditate upon me and worship me. They meditate upon me and worship me. Why is it? Why is it worship? Because they are matpara, matpara. Their commitment is to Ishwara, not nothing else. He is the ultimate end, not the last end, but the end. These people want moksha for the sake of moksha, and if a certain that Ishwara is moksha swarupa, they know that they have to gain knowledge of Ishwara. That is their ultimate as well as their immediate end. If it is their only end, they will become sannyasis. If they realize they have to prepare themselves for that end by gaining anta karana suddhi, they will become karma yogis. To neutralize raga dvesha, they live a life of karma yoga. But the end and the pursuit of knowledge with that end in view are common to both. Okay, that's enough. Thank you. So in verse 6 to 8, uh, we've done verse 6 to 7, but in all three verses, we will talk about upasana yoga level 2. So we're stepping down the rung of the spiritual ladder. We're going from nirguna bhakti to saguna bhakti. So what is upasana yoga level two? And then Krishna says, yetu sarvani karmani mayi sanyasya. In other words, dedicating your actions to Vishwarupa Ishwara, also otherwise called Virat. Or is Virat? Ishwara's total physical body, which consists of both subtle and gross matter. Okay, before I move forward, what does the word dedicate mean? How do you, what is like dedicate? We use this word, but what does dedicate mean? Because you're dedicating your actions. So what does dedicate mean? Surrender. Okay, I mean, now what is surrender? <laughs> Something more concrete. Like give up ownership? Like, you, it's not you. Okay, okay, okay good. One, one of them is... Before, before acting, bringing Ishwara into your consciousness or thinking about Ishwara before you act. Okay, good. So you bring it into the presence of Ishwara into your life, into your, in and through your actions. M Mina? Yeah, I was just saying the same thing, that acknowledging the fact that everything around you is Ishwara. Mm. You are also part of Ishwara. Whatever you are doing, Mm. You are doing by using the means which Ishwara has provided to you. Mm. So that's the kind of, uh, that's the meaning of surrendering all the actions to Ishwara. Good. Okay. Dropping so this good. Good. So there's knowledge of what you are dedicating to. That's the only way I can dedicate to. Okay. What about right. when a partner dedicates to another partner? What does this mean? I'm dedicated to my partner. Okay. Tell me more. <laughs> Exclusive. Exclusive. Okay, exclusive. In that case, dedicated to Ishwara, it means I'm exclusive to the entire world. Okay. Having faith in having faith in that person or trust in that person. Okay. Or, okay. or, or Ishwara in this respect that we're talking. Okay, good. Yeah. What else? When you're dedicated to your partner, what do you mean? Loyal. Loyal. Okay. Then, okay. 
nothing uh, in return, ex expecting nothing in return. Um, you know, expecting nothing in return, uh, according to Vedanta, is not really possible because the center, the, when a person is born, this, who is the center of your life? You are. <laughs> in fact, we all want something in return. And I will talk about this compensation. It is inbuilt in and through every human being. So yes, when you say expect nothing in return, it's more of a, it's more of a kind of like saying I'm loyal, but let's face it, you know, you expect your partner still to love you, to take care of you and, you know, to stand by your side. However, I do know what you mean when you say that. Okay. Okay. So these are some, uh, anything else? Thankful and gratefulness, gratitude. Okay. So I'm grateful for their presence. It's, okay. um, Example I'd use in real life is like prasad, like when you do the, uh, you, you dedicate the food to the Lord before you consume it. Like it's, uh -huh. it's okay. because of the Lord everything, as Mina said, because of the Lord, it's uh, everything is. Yeah, okay, good. Um, it's like a partner saying to you, I'm here for you in every way, whether it's bad or good, mm. whatever happens, I'm here for you. Ah, okay, I'm dedicated to you. Okay, very nice, Rani. Okay. So, talking a little bit about this word dedication. What does dedicating actions mean? Because what do we say originally? We said, yetu sarvani karmani. So, dedicate your actions, mayi in me, to me. So, I'll give you three things, three possible possibilities. The first one is every action is only for the sake of the ultimate end knowing myself as the one with the whole. Let's give it more concrete, this word dedication. Suppose you're cooking a meal. That means you're dedicated to preparing a meal for your family. Otherwise, your family is going to be disappointed. And then one of your, and you're in the kitchen, right? And then one of your um, close associates, uh, someone that's close to you, walks into the kitchen. And what are you doing? You're, um, you know, you're filling water. Uh, you're cutting vegetables. You're cleaning the sink anything other than cooking. I mean, there's no steam, nothing's being cooked. And yet you're doing all of these seemingly unrelated things. And I say, what are you doing? And you say, I'm cooking the meal. And I say, well, no, you're not. You're cutting vegetables, you're cleaning the sink. None of this has to do anything with the cooking. And you say, oh yes, it does. Because all of these subsidiary actions are my dedication, are my actions dedicated to the ultimate goal, which is putting a dish in front of your mouth. So please get out of the kitchen so I can continue cooking. So in other words, what does dedication mean? It means in and through my actions, they may seem unrelated, and yet each action is only in the name of fulfilling the ultimate end. So this means I first have to, you have to first know what is the ultimate end. Or second uh, description of dedication is whenever you're performing any action, it's not done for the sake of raga dvesha, for the sake of like and dislike. Even though in reality, every action will be colored by like and dislike, you cannot get away from this because as long as you're a human being, like and dislike will be through your actions. But it doesn't entirely dominate the person's thinking. That's what we mean. So instead of entirely on raga dvesha, attractions and, and repulsions, it is done for the sake of conforming to dharma and avoiding a dharma while recognizing simultaneously that these laws called dharma are provided by Ishwara. And also the consequences of whatever I put out is also provided by Ishwara. So as uh, we were actually all saying, this means I keep in mind where do these laws, where are they from? What's the origin of these laws which make me breathe, which make me cook, which make me move, which make me think, which make me remember, transact, work, anything. What, what is the source of these laws, Ishwara? So this means if you are keeping in mind Dharma and you don't associate Ishwara, this is not Upasana Yoga. This is just called being a good person. So if you want to include that sadhana aspect to it, then you have to associate your actions, which are conforming to Dharma, to the presence of Ishwara. And this is what's called meditating upon Saguna Ishwara. That means I'm keeping God in and through 
mundane activities. What kind of activities? Any activity, brushing teeth, driving, looking outside on a tree, anything. How do you keep God in it through all your activities? You need to understand what is the nature of what I am perceiving. And also, number three is, you also know, in reference to dedicating, you know that both the action that you put out and the fruit, the fruit means the result of the action, they are all coordinated by the Lord's hands. So just imagine the Lord with, you know, with huge hands and he's moving. You put out an action, you say something or you do something and he takes it with his hands and he puts it over there and says, okay, this is going to be fructified in, so, in, in this time and you know, this is what's going to happen. And this Lord's hand is a metaphor for what we call law of karma. It's kind of a nice poetical way to say the Lord's hands. The one that takes your words and then shows you the consequences of those words much later. The one that takes whatever you think or however you decide and then offers you with his hands the consequences of those actions. That is also called dedicating. Keeping in and through that both action and consequence are coordinated through Ishwara's order. What does dedicating actions look like in practice? Have me spoken a little bit about dedication. Let's look at now a person who is practicing this with an attitude that is ticking all the marks that say, yes, you are indeed dedicating your actions to the Lord. What does it look like? First of all, you have to understand, de dedication is an attitude. What do you mean by this? What kind of attitude? It means my boundary of control ends once the undertaking is finished. Once you let go of the pen, that's it. That's where your control ends. So this means, number one, I need to know, once I say things, once I let things go, that is it. I have done my duty. What happens therefrom if this pen turns upside down, topsy-turvy, if it hits something else and breaks something else? That is completely out of your control. So first of all, what kind of attitude it is? Boundary of control ends once my undertaking is finished. Whatever I've put out into the field, it gets entwined and mixed with all of the other variables in the universe, including the actions of other jivas. All of that goes into one big grand order, and it's tracked perfectly according to the order. You never receive a, a knock on your door for a crime that you haven't committed. Whatever knocks you receive, they are related to something that you have done, something that is related to you and not someone else. For every cause, there is a proportional one-to-one -one ratio effect. This also means this attitude that we're talking about, I prepare myself for whatever the consequences may be. That's the difference between a child and a grown person. A child is not willing or not having taking the time to accept the potential consequences, whereas an adult, they say, okay, I've done the best I could. I may receive exactly what I want. I may receive opposite to what I want. I may receive uh, more of what I want, or I may receive nothing at all. So these four options, these four possibilities are possible, and I need to be perfectly comfortable with them. And even when they do come, you say, okay, so this is the grand order. I don't know how it took place, but it still took place because of the many variables that contributed to the previous action that I've put out into the field. So in summary, what does dedicating actions to the Lord mean? Whatever undertaking you put out, whatever actions you do, and whatever results you receive, you understand it is only possible because of this grand order which you didn't set up yourself. In fact, we're all born into a world ready with these orders set up for us. We simply find ourselves in this world with these orders. Finally, with what kind of mindset do we practice Upasana Yoga level two? And then Krishna says, Ananyena Eva Yogena. In other words, refusing to get too distracted, refusing to give all of your power away to attention-seeking experiences, events. Turn on the TV, it wants your attention. Dog barks, wants your attention. Um, 
you know, someone uh, wants to talk to you. Okay, every time you say yes, 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 yes. The whole life goes like this, giving attention away to something else and never really finding the time to address, to, to be at peace with oneself and to get to know oneself. Because why? We're trained to say yes every time something wants our attention. So this means the person needs to set boundaries in order to be dedicated or in order to dedicate their actions to the Lord. What does a boundary mean? It means I respect your place, but I also respect my place equally. And then by, or through that, we will find something that works. But I will certainly not give all of my power away or all of my time away just to accommodate the needs of others. Because there's also a person who also needs to self-accommodate him or herself. And a nice example of this is, suppose you are on a train. We're all on a train right now. And we're going from place A to place B. Place B is Moksha. And then when you get off the train, obviously it's a long ride. So obviously you're gonna tr stop at some train stations. And what do you do? You go eat, you have some conversation with friends, you know, some sightseeing tours, maybe go on a helicopter ride, uh, go in a restaurant, play some games, watch a you know, soccer match or something. But through all of that, what is in the back of your head? Yeah. I need to get back on the train. If I don't, I'm going to miss the train. And that's going to not be a pleasant experience at all. So this means even though you are fully in the world, stopping, involving yourself, loving, doing, helping, in and through all of that, you never let go of that primary goal to which you are dedicated to. And for that reason, you always put yourself back on track. Therefore, you get back on the train and continue the ride. That's called not willing to be distracted. Why? Because that goal is in and through all of your activities. So it means it needs to become important enough in order for you to keep it in your mind, uh, in and through the distractions and the events that happen. Okay, next week we will continue verse seven. Upasana Yoga Level 2. So far, we have done verse 6. We have two more verses to complete Upasana Yoga Level 2. Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramayaha Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Ma Kashchiddu Kabhag Bhavet Om Shanti 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 Shanti